I think given that we're all waiting here, I'll gently try and ease myself into starting. Um, I, mean, I guess you can more or less see and you can more or less hear, so what I thought I'd kind of ramble into was attempting to explain what I was hoping we as a community might achieve. I think it's a pretty daunting topic, global, scary, global, big, the lot, all of it. Um, not only that, but I think if we start thinking about the extent of what we've done or we're trying to do around the globe, around the world, we immediately start having to worry about the history of it as well as the geography of it. Um, and I think those two factors um, are a um, wicked mixture. I don't think uh, there is no way uh, any of us, me, any of us, can summarize um, mobile learning around the globe or mobile learning back through the last 10 years. And that's very definitely not my point. Um, actually, my, my point about generalizations is that there aren't any. Um, the headline is that there are, no, there are no headlines. There is not a global picture. There are very, very many fragmented, fragmentary instances and examples, projects and pilots. Um, and I think actually our problem a lot of the time, especially when we talk to policy makers or managers or funders, is that we, can, we think we can turn that mess of experience into some kind of reasoned abstraction. Uh, and I think it's uh, a very dangerous flaw in our thinking, but sadly a very seductive and attractive one as well. So I think that's one of my ambitions, is to try and provoke more people into thinking about that, rather than hoping there'll be a, an easy headline to recognize that we actually need to get into the, uh, into the small print. About a fortnight ago, I gave a talk to um, a USAID symposium, um, and they very helpfully given me a title, What Has the Last 10 Years Taught Us? Um, my immediate reaction was, nope, not a lot. Uh, we are have to kind of work it out for ourselves, just the people in this room. Uh, and that's still my reaction. Um, I, I think actually not only of the not not only of the last ten years not taught us much historically, but what happens in all the various countries hasn't necessarily taught us much geographically. And actually, um, if Henry Ford said history is bunk. Um, he was probably right. Don't expect to learn from it. And don't expect to learn very much from looking at what's been happening in other parts of the world. I mean, I think maybe I've got a secondary ambition. Um, and that's actually that I feel what we've done has been poorly documented. So we actually haven't heard from uh, Chinese audiences or Russian audiences or uh, people who use Arabic or many people from Latin America. And I suppose it would be nice if actually more of their stuff rose to the surface. Um, if, we, if we are desperate to reason about what we've done for the last 10 years and what we're doing around the globe, then let's at least try and reason with all of it rather than just um, the bits that get reported in English. And sadly, often the bits that get reported in English from South Africa and the UK. Um, so partly I'm trying to just sensitize you to the fact that there's a lot of stuff out there. I can't summarize it, and it'd be nice if there was some more, and we could all struggle to do something with it, but hopefully not just turn it into um, a generalization, a platitude, or an abstraction. Uh, when I mentioned that I was doing a talk for USAID, I, I, I put something on Facebook saying, OK, what shall I say? And um, someone came back with something like, mobile is Africa's next educational revolution, and said if I didn't like that one, there were lots of other cliches I could fall back on. Um, yes, that's the problem. Uh, there are quite a few of them already. Um, and sometimes I look back upon what we've done and what I've seen happening around the world, and I try and make some generalizations. What has it shown? What can we infer? Um, and I'd be quite happy to hear more instances if you like, that trouble my superficial generalization about what happens and what have we achieved and what's, what's going on in the rest of the world. Um, one of the things I sometimes say is that what we've managed to achieve is that we can reach communities and people, um, maybe even countries, that were previously unreachable by any other educational 
intervention. And that sounds really attractive, well, really attractive, really obvious, and sadly not as straightforward as it sounds. Yes, we've reached all of those communities, or we've tried to, and they're not necessarily just communities separated by geographical distance or sparsity uh, or infrastructure. They're communities separated from us, uh, us in our institutions, us with our high technology, um, separated from us by economics, um, social factors, money. Um, so in fact, one of the things we've achieved is reaching out to people who are homeless. Um, and that sounds, again, that sounds really straightforward and we can do it anywhere in the globe and we've probably tried doing it in quite a few places around the globe. Um, but is it straightforward? Um, I, I made a remark something like that at a conference in Africa um, and then realized that when I said we take learning to distant communities, what of course I meant was that we take our learning to distant communities. I was on the verge of making a kind of a Columbus discovered America sort of remark. Clearly Columbus didn't discover America, there were people already there. Clearly we don't take learning to distant communities, we take our learning to distant communities sometimes whether they like it or not. Um, so in looking at what's happening around the globe, that is one, um, one of the factors to bear in mind. Um, and for me, an increasingly worrying one. What's happening around the globe, maybe I'll come back to that, is um, globalization. Clearly, what happens around the globe is globalization. Um, what happens within communities is that they each have their own way of um, thinking, learning, knowing. They have their own pedagogy. Um, how it is in formal and informal groups, they learn things, teach other people things. Um, how they demonstrate they've learnt it, how they test that someone else knows it, who counts as authoritative in their community as someone to learn it from. Um, and actually, the, the power of our technology could quite easily um, ride roughshod over that. I, I have a slide showing a small girl sipping at the fire hose. It's kind of like that. We have the opportunity to connect communities to the global information superhighway, but to um, maybe turn them into kind of cultural roadkill in the process. So when we look at what's happening around the globe, um, there is a temptation to see it as benign and straightforward. I, that's one of the other things I'd like to trouble, actually. Is it benign? Is it straightforward? Can I just check, there's anyone out there, by the way? This is, at a certain point, you kind of catch yourself and you think, I'm talking. I'm in an empty room and I'm talking. Um, I'll take that to be a yes. Right, OK. Um, so, OK. Um, globally, what we've succeeded in doing, if you regard it as a success, is provide the infrastructure and the technology to take possibly our version of learning to other communities. And, and um, I, I probably at least hinted why that might be problematic, because some of those communities might be too... Um, culturally fragile to stand up to us. Um, I have colleagues working with the San in the Kalahari. We see the Roma in Western Europe, uh, the Gypsies, Romani. Um, uh, or people working with the Maasai, nomadic communities in East Africa. Um, and it's not a done deed. It's not a, um, a obvious that those communities can take our kind of learning on board and still maintain their own, if you like, cultural integrity, cultural resilience. Uh, you know, if it's kind of us against them, they're not very big. Um, and I think why that is worrying is not just kind of on an ecological and ethical basis, but actually the increased use, the increased attractiveness of mobile learning might be that it seems to have scale. The technology scales up, uh, the infrastructure scales up, the handsets scale up. We kind of assume that the, the teaching and the learning and the pedagogy will scale up as well. That if you can do it for one class, you can do it for 50. If you can do it for one society, you can do it for 50. And that's not quite the same as saying if you can do it with one handset, you can do it with half a million. Um, and I think because of the attractions of what might be the economies of scale, in this case, global economies of scale, um, the economic argument um, is sometimes more attractive and more obvious than the kind of cultural one. Um, but when I started to think about this, it became 
increasingly worrying rather than decreasingly worrying. And that's because, actually, I think the whole process of education is a process of acculturation. Um, and there are various societies who are being brought into education. So in the UK, we have non-traditional students, working class people who are not used to, didn't grow up in the world of universities. There's no one that's been to university in their street, in their family, um, in their informal uh, community. Uh, and going to university is not just learning things and learning how to do things. It's learning how to become a different kind of person. Essentially, it's becoming one of the professionals or one of the middle classes. And that's maybe no different from what we're trying to do when we take learning to nomadic communities, to gypsies um, as well. We're trying to bring them into our society. We're using education to do that. Um, and mobile technologies reach out to types of communities that any other technology or any other education intervention would struggle with. Um, so if we're looking at a global picture, some of the factors at work, um, well, I've just, yeah, some, I'm trying to outline some of the factors at work in what seems to be um, uh, kind of benign and straightforward. One of the other things we've done at, a, at a, not an, an international level rather than a global one maybe is show that we can actually change what education looks like or feels like. You know, we, we can now deliver on um, the ideas of personalized learning, authentic learning, situated learning, uh, contextual learning. Uh, we've got all sorts of technologies that allow us to make education more spent, spontaneous, to take it out of the textbooks, to take it out of the classrooms, to go into field work, to go into internships, to make um, becoming a nurse, becoming a doctor, becoming a teacher more vivid, um, to connect people to their learning community at the same time as connecting them and situating them in the type of environment they're learning about. Um, but so far, we've depended on that kind of advance in how we, how we understand, how we conceptualize learning and education. Um, we, that's happened amongst maybe rich countries, um, rich individuals, rich institutions. And so if we look at the, the global picture, there is a risk that actually this is quite divisive. Um, some people express a kind of faith in the fact that this will trickle down. I'm not sure because I think it's militated or mediated by political factors, um, economic factors, fi financial factors, all sorts of things. Someone mentioned recently that uh, there's an import duty on phones entering, I think it's Brazil. So all of a sudden, compared to the rest of the world, phones cost twice as much in Brazil, handsets cost twice as much. There's just a kind of granularity around those kinds of things um, that means trickling down or technological determinism it isn't necessarily the order of the day. It won't work. So if we return to the, the, the bigger theme, what's happening around the world, yeah, there are lots of accounts of it. You, I think I gave some um, URLs and some sources, resources, looking at, for example, the research outputs in the International Association of Mobile Learning, in the MLEARN conference series, uh, in, we, what, in what we gracefully call the WMPTE conferences. WMTE. Um, you can look at their outputs. They're probably online. Uh, the IEEE, um, the IEE in different countries also have online resources where researchers give their accounts of what happened. Um, and you can attempt to reason about, will it work somewhere else? Is it going to go somewhere else? What does it mean for somewhere else? Um, what is it telling you about the global picture? But I think you have to bear in mind that even if you're looking at the research output and assuming it's kind of professional researchers um, and therefore not uh, biased or skewed, you have to bear in mind that researchers only work for what gets funded to be researched. Um, so it's not a level playing field. Um, I guess if they want to stay being funded, reporting on failures can be quite problematic. Reporting on successes can be quite straightforward. Um, there are all sorts of different biases in what gets reported. And I guess there are all sorts of different biases in how it gets evaluated and what the nature of the success seems to be and how you attribute the causes to it. OK, so something might be undeniably a success, but explaining how it got to be a success 
uh, can be really quite difficult. People talk about critical success failure factors, they don't talk about critical failure factors. And I think if we included those in and started to report and document um, what went wrong as well as what went right um, around the world, the global picture might be a lot more reliable. Um, so there's that, there's that going on when we look at the amount of information that seems to be available um, from online resources around the world. I think in looking at around the world, something else is at work, and that's the fact that the economies of the world, as we look back, won't resemble the economies of the future as we look around the world. So to some extent, I think the history of mobile learning and the way in which it's been reported around the world can be quite deceptive. Uh, a lot of what we've reported in our research literature has been small-scale projects, uh, fixed-term projects, projects that were subsidized, projects that were run by enthusiasts, often projects that depended on the funder or the researcher providing the technology, the gadgets, the hardware, and projects that took place around the world in economies that were compared to today's standards, buoyant, upbeat. Um, so when we look around the world and try to get a global picture, um, it's possibly quite a um, misleading picture. Uh, if mobile learning is to have a future, then it's probably not going to be on the basis of small-scale projects. It's not going to be run by enthusiasts. We're probably running out of enthusiasts. It's going to be run by ministries, by officials, by managers, by rank-and-file teachers, by community activists. And so what, when we look at what's happening around the globe, much of that may be misleading. Um, of course, a lot of what's happened around the globe hasn't been remotely research-based. It's someone having a hunch, um, and it's been someone having a hunch around using mobiles to do some good. Um, but I often worry about when we look at either of these kinds of interventions, either research-led or socially useful, um, whilst they might be good in their own right, whilst they might have good outcomes and uh, credible evaluation, exactly how do we learn what we can transfer anywhere else? Um, you know, if we don't reliably know about the success factors, the failure factors, and the cultural, institutional, organizational context, how can we say that what happens in one part of the globe tells us anything about what might be useful in another part of the globe? Um, I don't know how that works. Um, uh, so this isn't a kind of council of despair or misery or pessimism. It's uh, hopefully a council of scrutiny. Um, so in looking at the global picture, those are some of the things I think we might very, 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 very cautiously learn from. Um, and maybe if we learn nothing at all, that would be better than learning the wrong things. Um, there's a Neil Young song where he starts off by saying, don't listen to me, take my advice. Uh, maybe that's what I'm saying. Um, one of the other things I, th I used to think we'd achieved was that we've challenged or uh, extended or disrupted educational theories. Um, that um, social constructivist theories or active network theory or act activity theory or whatever has been challenged and stretched by what people in the mobile learning research community have done. Um, the theories that we have now are not the theories that we had 10 years ago. Um, several reasons make me think that's not quite as straightforward as I used to think it was. I think much of the early research work in mobile learning has been a reaction to e-learning, to ed tech or learning with computers. It's been a, um, an attempt to deliver on the aspirations of learning with computers. Um, and so when learning with computers aspired to deliver learning anytime, anywhere, well, we actually could. They couldn't. Um, when learning with computers wanted to be more 
contextual or more uh, personalized, well, they struggled, we could do it. Uh, but I think that means to some extent that we're constrained by our history and I think the, the sense in which our theories are constrained is that they are constrained by that ancestry or that provenance and I think the e-learning community comes out of a set of disciplines, maybe cognitive science or artificial intelligence, um, but basically um, psychology and education and technology. But actually mobiles are not a merely educational phenomenon, um, they're a social phenomenon these days. In different parts of the world, um, in different ways, they're actually universal. They're not something which happens in institutions in the way that e-learning used to. Um, and so I, I worry that um, an ancestry or a trajectory from e-learning is not necessarily a reliable foundation for a phenomenon which, in a sense, is not actually very educational. I and mean, I don't think educate. I don't think mobile learning is educational in the way that e-learning is. I think it's a social phenomenon which we try to give some educational value to, and that's rather different. Uh, but it also means that in terms of the, uh, I don't know, theoretical basis of what we're doing, maybe there ought to be a bit more sociology, a bit more anthropology, a bit more development studies, uh, a bit more information sciences, uh, and a bit less psychology, maybe. Um, I don't know. I think, um, yeah, mobile learning pl takes place al fresco or it doesn't take place at all. So we've got to look at how do we understand what happens out there, not in here quite so much. But also in looking at a global picture, um, well, actually, any of those remarks are not particularly global. Um, they are a particular set of, if you like, Western conceptions about theories of learning. And at the USAID talk I gave a couple of weeks ago, um, I was kind of rather embarrassed when I made these remarks. I was kind of rather embarrassed because I was saying, well, mobile learning has, has challenged educational theories. Uh, and I was looking at an audience of policymakers and um, the donor community and thinking, why would this interest them? Um, uh, and then I realized, of course, that we, anyone in the mobile learning activist and development community, must have educational theories, however bad they are, just because everyone else on the planet has already got some. Uh, and they might not be sophisticated educational theories like um, social constructivism. They're probably just rather simple ones like content is king. And if we want to engage with people who think content is king, then we actually have to have some alternatives. They might be really obscure and difficult to explain, but I think that's actually our professional responsibility and our professional challenge. Um, to find the kinds of arguments that will engage with m maybe more trite or less thoughtful um, theories about what goes on when people learn uh, than merely thinking, whoops, um, theory is embarrassing, we better not talk about it. Uh, but there's a third reason why um, I think we're on um, tricky territory when we talk about theory, and that's, as, again, as I say, because much of it has been generated by a particular culture, um, uh, a particular intellectual culture, maybe around uh, universities in Western Europe, South Africa, and parts of North America. Um, and when we talk about the global significance of mobile learning, there is the risk that we're going to globalize those theories. So we're not only going to kind of up, um, uh, scale up our technology, but we're going to scale up the pedagogy that's kind of implicit in how we talk about our pedagogy. Um, and so one of the things I'm concerned about is actually indigenous knowledge and how buried in um, different cultures indigenous knowledge there must be ideas about learning, effectively their theories of learning, not ours. And I don't think we've, we're in a good position to build on those because I don't think we know very much about those. Um, and unfortunately when I talk to the, for example, the agency community or the donor community. Um, again, the attractions of scale, return on investment, um, economies of scale 
can ease and and what seem to be common sense notions that content is king, for example, uh, are very kind of straightforward and seductive. And so uh, the nuances of how diff different communities learn uh, could easily get parked in a special interest group, whereas actually I think it's central. Um, just to take stock, there is still someone out there, isn't there? This is really worrying me. Um, because I was told, oh, ah, <laughs> fabulous. <laughs> um, oh, and there are questions. And I, I'm going to have to now try and understand how this interface works, which is never a good thing for me. Um, yeah, I think I agree with the various points people are making. Uh, and, and you could argue that, that um, however much time we have in attempting to um, simplify and explain what we're talking about, uh, we also don't do it justice. And so anyone that says it's more complicated than that, it's more difficult than that, uh, they're right, I'm agreeing with them. Uh, so th to some extent, this is, this is me attempting to replace some generalizations with some different ones. But actually, if you've got your own kind of granular and individualistic position, uh, great. The more people that disagree with me, the better. Um, let me just move on slightly. Um, I am ad-libbing this, by the way, so um, uh, so I'm now lost for words. Um, yes, yeah, so I've tried to not give a global picture, but actually say that if we look at the globe, it's really quite problematic. Um, and I think as I've hinted, it's becoming more problematic because uh, when no one had heard of mobile learning, we couldn't do much damage. Now, a lot of people seem to have heard it. We could really make a mess of things. Um, again, at a different conference in Africa, I once said I thought we were safe from e-learning because it wouldn't work uh, in an African context. You know, it'll be institutional um, and for all sorts of reasons about infrastructure, money, resources, training, capacity, and all the rest of it, um, it'll just stay in locked rooms in Africa. Um, but what worried me about mobile learning was that it might succeed, and, and I've probably given some hints as to what, uh, why that concerns me. Uh, but nevertheless, we have a, a challenge on our hands, I think, when we look at the global picture, and that's actually that um, a number of agencies over the last two and a half years, two years, have started to see this as a significant and economic way of them delivering on their missions to make the world a better place. So USAID is certainly one of them. We now have a um, Mobiles for Education for Development uh, group, uh, an M Education Alliance that had its second um, annual symposium just recently. We now have a UNESCO um, section within their ICT and education work that we didn't have some years ago. Um, we have reports going to the World Economic Forum. We have people within the World Bank. Um, we have commercial and corporate concerns thinking that, well, at the very, very crudest, um, this is some way of accessing their next billion subscribers or their next billion sub customers. Um, mobiles are a way of reaching a market they haven't reached before, as well as reaching learners that they haven't reached before. Um, and so at the risk of um, a worrying paraphrase, uh, all it takes for the triumph of evil is the good do nothing. Uh, not that I'm calling any of those people evil, but I'm certainly worried that we need to be in there uh, saying something about the complexity of the situation and um, how what we've learned and what we haven't learned in the past 10 years from different places around the globe can make an intelligent contribution to their work and to them delivering on their missions. It's just that we're going to have to struggle to figure out what it is. And as I've said, the part of the reason why we're going to have to struggle to figure out what it is is because this isn't the world it used to be um, in terms of the relationships between different societies around the world, the technologies they own, and their various individual ideas about learning, which is partly why I keep talking about tipping point, um, because uh, I think we are in a, a change dynamic between um, technology, educationalists, and our communities. Uh, around the world. I think this is true anywhere around the world, differently around the world, but anywhere around the world. Um, 
So that's another of my concerns, uh, and I think I'm probably um, yeah reaching the end of what I had to say. I mean, two of the things I wanted to raise that implicitly are of global significance are ethics and evaluation. Um, university researchers have usually got some procedures for ensuring that their research interventions do no harm. Um, but if you look at agencies and you look at corporations, they don't have those kind of rudimentary checks and balances in place. Um, universities and research institutes maybe have some kind of way of asking themselves if they're going to do any harm. Uh, maybe their procedures are out of date. Maybe they are sometimes tokenistic. Maybe they are sometimes paternalistic. Um, a lot of the time, it's them that decide what harm consists of rather than the communities they work with. And that might well be a kind of safe way of looking at things if the communities you work with are very similar to your own. But if you're in cyberspace working with communities around the other side of the world, your understanding of what is harm in their views and in their culture is perhaps rather different and not easy to grasp or understand or to access. Um, so um, I think there, are, there is an ethical dimension which we overlook. And again, at, at a different event recently, I was thinking, yes, we're all nice people doing good things. Why, why do I think this is ethically problematic? Well, one of the things I think it's one of the reasons I think it's ethically problematic is that in the development community, working in the global south, for example, what you hear an awful lot of the time is people talking about unexpected consequences. I'm not quite sure how ethically you address the outcomes of consequences you can't even predict. Uh, so we not only do we need more um, collaborative um, ethical procedures, but we also need more more resilient ones, maybe the process of, con of, of continuous consent rather than the process of one-off consent would be a small step in the right direction. But certainly the whole issue of unintended consequences um, puts the cat amongst the pigeons in terms of ethical procedures. Um, and one of the other um, cultural dimensions to the ethics of what we do globally in mobile learning um, is that amongst the research community and the educational community, there is a lot of emphasis on the nature of our duty to educate other people, but very little focus on the nature of our right to educate them. So that's putting the question in a different way, but I still think it's, it's problematic um, and is something that we can quite easily um, go straight past without noticing or find that ethics has been demoted to something that's called a special interest group. Um, and I think a related concern is evaluation. Um, uh, I mean, I won't go into my concerns about evaluation here and now, but certainly I'm always very concerned about what evaluation tells us um, and to what extent we can trust it. Is it asking the right questions? Um, has it got the right techniques and the right technologies for working in a mobile space? Has it got the right techniques and technologies for working with um, other communities? Has it got um, a secure ethical basis for proceeding? Do we know how to disseminate and engage with appropriate audiences so that it actually makes a difference? So, um, I don't know how long I've been talking, but it feels like the last day and a half. Um, I'd actually welcome now any any reactions, and I don't know if this is going to be mainly through the uh, um, the, the chat window. That might be easiest. Um, what do people think? What do people feel? Hi. Ah, Inga's saying I can use the top menu bar with down arrow. Top menu bar with top menu. Uh. On, the right. on the right, on the right. Um, I guess it's this one then.
just muted myself with hand pencil. Oh, really? Uh, yes, that's right. It's not actually doing anything. So uh, let's text. Let's chat. All right, I can see oh, several people typing. Fabulous. Oh, I see the micro. Oh, yeah, that says live audio is on. Click to mute the audio, which I think if I do that, you then. So now I've unmuted. What I'll do is just go through the uh, some of the comments people have made, and maybe that would um, be a way of engaging. Um, Yeah, someone says earlier on that collaboration projects in a country, continent, or a global level are um, a way for future research. Um, yeah, I think that's probably true. I think certainly collaboration is the way to um, build more resilient um, programs in countries or continents. Uh, I think they are incredibly hard work and not the kind of thing we're necessarily good at if we come from a research background. Um, we have to engage with different types of people that we're not used to engaging with, um, who might be commercial or regulatory or whatever. I think we also have to recognize that some parts of the ecosystem, particularly the networks, um, uh, are the hardest possible work to engage with and collaborate with. Uh, I mean, my experience has been that um, the networks are making enough money without bothering to talk to educationalists. Um, I think the GSMA are very good and have done some interesting work to both look at how there might be viable business models and to look at country level surveys that show uh, what the nature of the community and the need and the infrastructure actually are. Um, uh, but actually, uh, yeah, collaboration as a way forward um, is undoubtedly a good thing. Uh, it's just going to be the type of hard work that maybe we're not used to. There are people working on this, uh, I mean, within the business community that are kind of reaching out to us. I think to some extent we've been our own worst enemies in some respect when we've engaged with certain parts of the ecosystem uh, and that we've gone for short-term project funding when we ought to have looked at what would be um, sustainable for all the parties involved. Uh, and I think that we're, we're kind of almost starting from scratch or starting a second time in looking at how collaboration would work, how that would 
fit into a sustainable ecosystem. And the next question becomes, OK, if we can imagine collaboration and sustainable collaboration, how exactly do local communities um, fit into that? So uh, I mean, uh, as with a lot of what I've said, um, uh, there are ways forward, but they're quite tricky um, ways forward. Oh, Simon. So, oh, sorry. Someone says they they defined evaluation criteria before commencing. Yeah, I'm sure. Yes, I, mean, I suppose we all do that. Um, I mean, there's, I think there are the problems at a number of levels. I mean, with innovative projects, and especially with mobile learning projects in the early years, we were working with technology which was clunky and difficult. Um, and uh, we seemed to get the timescales wrong every time and spent far more effort and resource um, getting the technology to work that we anticipated. And what slips or slips off the end is the evaluation phase. Um, I think we've also not necessarily been as professional and skilled in evaluation as we were at doing the original educational and technological research. Um, that's at one level, and then slightly higher up. It, yes, if we um, if we build in the evaluation during the funding pitch, then that implies we're doing it to appeal to the funders. Um, and I guess there are some things they think they would like to hear or learn about, and some things they wouldn't. Um, so, so I think there are a variety of problems with evaluation. I think, actually, there's a, a kind of methodological problem with evaluation for mobiles as well, actually, that, that we're only just getting the technologies that allow us to do evaluation, to capture what's going on in the moment kind of in world, whereas previously we'd have to kind of stop everything and do the evaluation out of world. We'd make people do a questionnaire or give them a structured um, or semi-structured interview, which is kind of antithetical to the idea of movement and mobility. Um, but I think that's that's now becoming more possible. And there's a, there's a research community, for example, based around the University of Lancaster, looking at the socio sociology of mobilities, where they're interested in how do you learn about a world that moves around um, rather than just inheriting the methods of a world that didn't. Yeah, someone's talking about uh, um, using evaluation to quote prove what is wanted. Yeah, and I think the, the remark about um, a lot of the time what we don't get is policy informed evidence, what we get is evidence informed. No, sorry, I've got that the right way around. What we, what we, what, what the rhetoric says is, is that we're after policy-based evidence, and what we often get is evidence-based policy. No, I'm still doing that the wrong way around. I think I'll about skip that. You know what I mean? Evidence-based policy formulation, yes, is what we're supposed to have, and what we end up having is um, policy-based evidence formulation. Hmm. Someone's asking about. Oh. Someone's asking about educational research as opposed to business interventions, and are they? Would their frameworks be different? I'm not quite sure what is meant, but I, um, I think I'm still trying to understand how businesses work. Um, I think one of our problems from our side of the fence is that whilst we've produced evidence, and yeah, people have already alluded to the way in which that might be flawed or constrained, um, whilst we've produced evidence, we haven't actually worried very much about why are we doing it, who's it for, and what might it change. And I think that, that partly means that we haven't been able to 
take evidence to governments in ways that are convincing enough to change government policy. Um, we've often proved that one type of mobile learning is better than another type of mobile learning, or one kind of educational technology is better than another kind of educational technology, but actually governments might need to know um, uh, whether mobile learning is better than school libraries, and, and we haven't actually kind of addressed that. Um, and we haven't taken evidence to businesses that shows them that there is some kind of socially useful, um, economically sustainable things they can do with mobiles. Um, how do we get education beyond the control of governments and politicians? Um, I'm not sure if we need to, actually. Um, I mean, uh, I suppose my point would be that e-learning was definitely uh, an institutional phenomenon with expensive machines um, uh, and with a particular kind of ethos about innovation and innovators and hitting critical mass and finding the early adopters, um, and we could drive e-learning innovation from the top of organizations, from the top of institutions downwards. But actually, now what we're seeing is clearly the um, general population has much more access to sophisticated technology than a lot of the time we do within universities, um, colleges, schools, uh, and other institutions controlled by um, governments and politicians. Uh, I think our problem, or their problem, governments and politicians, is actually maintaining the credibility of educational systems in an age when uh, everything is more mobile and connected than they are. Uh, I mean, this is if you want to take this kind of argument to, to, to slightly further, you end up with a kind of Arab Spring depiction um, that, yes, we have seen our technologies and our ideas being used basically to liven up what was happening in educational institutions to um, enhance the existing curriculum or to make the existing institutions look more attractive. But actually, there's another way of looking at mobile learning that isn't around what went on in institutions as a way of making the, the curriculum and the profession and the institutions look more engaged or authentic or attractive. And that's actually, if you like, in the streets where people can generate their own learning information, ideas, opinions, where they can decide what it is they want to know and to share um, and, and who it's worth sharing it with um, in ways that are not just socially significant but also economically significant. Um, and I think the problem is not that we haven't proved that mobile learning is uh, educationally good, maybe we haven't, but actually what we are doing is implicitly aligning, aligning education with the world as it is, um, but our educational institutions, our governments and our politicians are not keeping up in that respect. Um, and if you look at how much of everyone's different economy at a national, organizational and individual level is devoted to the, the assets and resources um, and the methods that come from mobiles, and if you look, as I say, at how mobiles can be used to generate ideas, identities, information, images, um, completely beyond the control of um, educational institutions and government departments. Uh, uh, if you look at how it's changing our social life, um, our ideas about community and all the rest of it, community, identity, relationships, um, and especially when bearing in mind that many, many people, a very high proportion of people access social networks through mobile networks, um, the problem is, isn't actually how do we get education beyond the control of governments and politicians, the problem is actually can they keep up with what education now means. Someone's saying to, uh, mobile learning is more a matter of individual choice, but I think the nature of individuality and uh, an individual in relation to community is changed by mobiles, I mean in the way that it's changed by social networks as well, but actually um, with social networks on a computer, just like anything else on a computer, like learning on a computer, it's actually a discrete chunk of your time and resource. Um, you know, you're on your computer and your backs to the rest of the world. With mobiles, um, what you're doing on a mobile is woven into everything in the rest of the world. And so, um, yes, it might be mobile learning might be a matter of individual choice, but the nature of individuality and the nature of learning and the nature of mobility are all transformed by um, mobiles. So, I, I think. 
the meanings of many, many of these words that we're used to using uh, is becoming slippery and um, more kind of transient and subjective. I mean, you could argue that, that mobile learning makes information and knowledge more transient and subjective because we, we're in a, if you look at citizen journalism, for example, anyone is in a position to generate their own news item uh, within a community and to put their own spin on it. I mean, you could argue that, okay, it's not within the control of the news media, it's just in the control of YouTube instead, um, but it's still a different ecology of learning, information, news, and so on, uh, and therefore what education consists of. Oh, and someone saying mobile learning is sometimes the only choice. Yes, I mean, that takes us back right back to the early days. I mean, people were saying learning from SMS is educationally impoverished. True, uh, it's educationally impoverished, but in many parts of the world, or for many people's time, uh, it's their only choice. Um, it's not very good, but it's what we've got. It's not very good, but it's what they've got. Um, yeah, and so, you know, I don't, don't think we should be too precious or queasy about how we try and make things better. If that's the technology and that's the environment, that's what we're going to try and work in. Oh, someone's asking if I think there's a a reason for the gap in literature from outside the English-speaking world. Of course, I would say it's not the English-speaking world, it's, of course, the American-speaking world, and that's probably part of the answer. Um, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> as I'm English, and that's the world I live in, that's one of the reasons why I don't know. Um, and my grasp of other people's languages is dreadful. Um, uh, um, I mean, there are two possible answers. One is that it's all happening. It just doesn't get reported. It happens in a different uh, Francophone universe, Lucifone universe. You know, everyone's doing it, and they're doing it in their own language. It's just no one's translating from one to the other. Uh, but another possibility, it's not happening, which is why it's not being reported. And I'm not the right person to, to answer that in a way. I mean, the UNESCO published some regional surveys from South America, Southern Africa, and so on, in which they tried very, very impressionistically to get a sense of um, what's happening around the world. Um, but I suspect the kind of selection effects, you know, it's who you know and who reported their work to you and who wrote it up in an attractive form um, account for what gets reported and what, get, what, get, what doesn't. Whether there are more profound reasons, um, which might be the nature of the infrastructure, uh, but then if you look at the contrast in infrastructure between Western Europe and South Africa, I don't think that's a convincing answer. Uh, you know, much of Africa has a dreadful infrastructure that is very lively around using mobiles for uh, education and the economy and everything else. Um, if you look at North America, um, there's not much literature that came out from North America recently until suddenly they, they suddenly got it. Um, uh, when I first went to North America to talk about mobile learning, maybe 10 years ago, they said, what's the point? We have Wi-Fi coming out of the wallpaper. We have laptops in our cars. Why would we want to use mobiles? They're, they're small. The battery runs flat. Um, so there, are, uh, there might be reasons that mobile learning is not happening because the inf infrastructure is too bad, but I don't think so. There might be other reasons that actually the infrastructure in its broadest sense is too good. Um, and in that sense, the USA it's just catching up. Um, are there other kind of cultural reasons? I mean, there might be in the sense that different cultures have different ideas about learning. You know, some, some ideas about learning are very much around content or memorization. Um, uh, some school systems in very many parts of the world would see learning with mobile phones as disruptive. Um, it opens all sorts of dreadful opportunities for kids doing inappropriate things in schools and disrupting classrooms, um, uh, but slightly different school systems would see that in a slightly different way, but at a continental level or a cultural level that might account for some of the differences. Um, some cultures and some countries and some economies have more headroom, 
they had historically over the last 10 years more money to spend and therefore money to experiment with so they could do this stuff um, because it was coming out of a, a buoyant economy uh, and other countries didn't so it never happened. Um, I think irrespective of a remark about economics, some countries um, or, or communities have an ideology around big government. I don't know, Britain, Scandinavia, Singapore, the, the government sees itself in very broad terms taking a responsibility for the lives of its citizens, um, you know, and provides education and health care and so therefore when we offer the opportunity to innovate with, use, with mobiles, governments see that as part of their responsibility. Other countries don't. They have a little government ideology. You know, sometimes the USA has a little government ideology. Sometimes um, the UK has a little government ideology. So we look to activists and NGOs and the commercial sector, social entrepreneurs, to carry things forward. But that's quite haphazard sometimes and not always very successful. There isn't the government to fall back on. So that's a patchwork of reasons um, that is an incomplete explanation for how things get reported and what there was to report. I'm afraid I ought to draw it to a conclusion now. Um, I guess the best way of carrying this on, so because, because I have other commitments and the working day is just about to start, um, but another, another way of carrying this forward would be to actually carry on this in the discussion space um, in the Google group. So I'm quite happy to pick this up, any of your questions or remarks or um, disagreements even better. Um, yeah, later on in the day in the, the Google space. So um, uh, thanks for everyone's time and tolerance and patience and um, interaction and attention. Uh, I hope it made some sense. Um, uh -huh. Right. Okay. Yeah. So there are people telling me where to where to where to look and what we can do. So okay. Uh, it feels strange saying good morning, good day, good night. Have a good day, night, evening. Uh, my my grasp on time zones is so uncertain that it could be the weekend in some parts of the world. Um, Thanks a lot. Cheers. Goodbye. More later in a different space.